loving Father in heaven, we appreciate you this morning in this place you gave us, on this day you gave us, and uh, we pray please, Lord, as we come to you, that you would uh, fill us, that you'll um, reveal yourself to us, especially as we listen to your words spoken, and uh, may we come to know you a little better and grow in grace. And uh, we remember, Lord, there's some of our uh, group that aren't here today, especially Joy, who's suffering uh, in hospital. We pray you'd be especially close to her this Sabbath. She'd love to be here and uh, with us. And we pray that you'll give her a special blessing, Sabbath blessing. And uh, we're so glad that Loretta can be here with us again. And. Uh, Anyone uh, who's not here that we don't know about, we pray, please, a special Sabbath blessing for them. Lord, we are grateful to you for what you've done for us. That's why we're here today. And we remember the cross this morning. And thank you that you would uh, give your son to die for us. And may we appreciate again the cross today. And um, may we dedicate our lives to living for you and to witnessing to the people around us. We pray for our town that we can be a shining light um, for you and that people will be drawn to you because of this church. Please forgive our sin again this morning and uh, help us to be quick to confess. We thank you for repentance we can, where you can give us a new life. So we appreciate that life this morning. We especially pray for our little ones as they're growing up to learn these things. May they... Uh, come to appreciate your goodness and love for them. So we place ourselves in your care for this time and pray you'll especially um, bless Pastor as he prepared, as he's prepared uh, this message. May our hearts be open to hear what you have to say to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we focus on your word, we pray that this gospel will not only be clearly painted in our minds, but that the experience of it would be etched into our hearts. Glorify thy name in Jesus' name. Amen. In Romans chapter 1, Paul takes on the task of placing the entire non-Jewish world under condemnation. To his Jewish readers, this was simply logical. 
The non-Jewish world, of course, is called the Gentiles in the Bible. When you find that word Gentiles, you'll find that underneath it, the Greek or sometimes in the Hebrew, the word is essentially the word nations. That is to say anything and everything that is not Jewish is Gentile. The Jewish readers would have no problem with chapter 1 of the book of Romans because they already knew that. It was obvious if you had not been born into the family of Abraham, if you were not of the physical lineage of Abraham, if you were not Abraham's children according to the genetic factor, then you were the Gentiles and you were lost. He describes how that God has revealed himself to the Gentile world, but they rejected that knowledge, believing, choosing to believe a lie, and the result of that believing has led to consequences in behavior and action and um, you know, real life situations just manifesting their unbelief and their lostness. Chapter 2 in the book of Romans, Paul shifts gear and he begins to shock some of his Jewish readers because he says that those who, are, those who are with the law, those who have the law, this would clearly be a reference to the Jewish nation, are too, in a similar way, under condemnation. Perhaps, he says, even more so than the Gentile world because having the gospel or having the law, as he calls it, they should have known better and acted differently, but he concludes by saying that yet you who have the law practice the very things that you condemn in the Gentiles and on account of you the name of God is blasphemed amongst the Gentiles. Because you claim, but you don't live up to. Chapter 1 of the book of, Re of, of uh, Romans places the Gentile world under condemnation. Chapter 2 places the Jewish world under condemnation. Now that would have been revolutionary, that would have been completely unheard of, but Paul does this because he wants to lead both Jew and Gentile to the greater revelation, which is chapter 3 of the book of Romans, where he says, because all are lost because of sin, because all are condemned, whether having the law or not having the law, because all are under the condemnation of the law, Jesus has died for all, providing salvation to all. Now, very often when we think of the book of Romans, we think of the, one of the greatest treaties on the concept of righteousness by faith, that we are made right with God by our belief in God. But Romans takes it a step further. He's not just talking about the subjective, the personal, the me, myself, and I experience of salvation. Paul's revolutionary concept that he's introducing in the book of Romans is a universal grace available to all people of all nations in all places through what Jesus has done. The Jews were happy to accept that being a Jew, they could, they could receive Christ and be saved. But the argument that you find coming up again and again through all the New Testament books, at least those written by Paul, the book of Galatians, the book of Ephesians, the book of Romans, is constantly this issue of, do I have to first become a Jew before Christ will receive me? In other words, if you are already a Jew and practicing the Jewish religion, then yes, you can accept Christ. The Jews would accept that. But the problem for the Jewish mind was this revolutionary idea that the Gentiles could remain Gentile. They did not need to convert to Judaism and they could still be benefited by the blood of Christ simply by believing without doing a single other thing, by simply accepting Jesus without becoming Jewish, they could become a part of the family of God on earth and heaven. Romans chapter 1. The entire Gentile world is condemned because of sin. Romans chapter 2. The entire believing world is condemned because of sin. Romans chapter 3. Nevertheless, God has provided a manifestation of his righteousness apart from the law. So that whether you have the law or you don't have the law doesn't matter. There is a righteousness apart from the law that saves. And that righteousness is found in the person of Jesus. Romans chapter 4. He has to substantiate this revolutionary concept from scripture. And so he goes to the Old Testament scriptures and he uses both David 
and the patriarch Abraham himself as the example of this radical revolutionary concept. Essentially what he says is, Abraham, the believer of all believers, the father of all who believed, were accounted righteous before God before he became a Jew. Our ancient patriarch, he says to the Jewish nation, the one that we track our Judaism from, the one that first appeared to, uh, or, or, or that God appeared to and placed the call and made the promise of the Jewish nation, was at one time not a Jew. He was not circumcised. And there was no Jewish nationality at that time on planet Earth. He was merely a patriarch, a father of the nation, who chose to believe God. When God came to him and gave him the gospel promise and said, I will make of you a great nation. Yes, your wife is too old to have ch children. She's past menopause. She's well beyond the hot flashes and all the rest of it. But she is going to be pregnant. And Abraham, we won't even talk about how old you are and incapable of having children you are. Forget about that. I'm telling you, Abraham, you are going to have a son. And through that son, I will bless all nations and I will bless the world through your seed. And Galatians applies that word seed particularly to Jesus, which ties in with what Jesus said to the woman at the well in John chapter 4 when, she, when he said to her, salvation is of the Jews takes us right back to the original promise given to Abraham, that Abraham, I am beginning with you to make something great. I'm taking you as dead as you are, and I'm taking your wife as dead as she is, and I'm going to bring forth something that is truly miraculous, something that is born of promise. And then I'm going to take that man, and I'm going to make him a mighty nation. And then that takes us all the way down to the land of Egypt, right? 400 years after the promise is made to Abraham, when he brings the mighty nation of, e of Israel, Israel out of Egypt. And then you've got the whole Old Testament era that you know the history of. Until eventually Jesus is born through that Jewish lineage and blesses the entire world by the death of the cross. When God came to Abraham and made that promise, he was essentially making that promise to a Gentile. Do you get my logic? He was essentially making that promise to a Gentile because Abraham was not a Jew. He was as uncircumcised as anybody else. But Hebrews chapter, sorry, Romans chapter 4 verse 3 says, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him, attributed to him, his belief. His plain and simple, his belief in the promise of God, in the rise of a mighty nation, and ultimately the particular salvation seed in the person of Jesus, his belief despite the circumstances of improbability, the genetic impossibility, he believed God, and because he believed God, he was accounted before God as righteous. He did nothing. He chose to believe and was accounted by God as righteous. Are you following the story so far? Then he was circumcised. Then the beginning of the Jewish nation happened. And Paul's argument is, if our father Abraham was to all intents and purposes, by the way, in his day, you would have counted a Jew to be a Jew. If Abraham was to all intents and purposes, essentially a Gentile who believed and was made righteous on the basis of his belief and nothing else, then why in our day and age can the Gentiles not be made right with God simply by believing without becoming a physical Jew? He says, we have the Old Testament scriptures to back this up. Salvation is not being saved by a church, a denomination, a nationality, a genetic inheritance. Neither is it being saved by your works. Salvation is choosing on the basis of Abraham to believe, because he says in the book of Romans, all who believe are accounted to be children of Abraham because, far, because Abraham is the father not merely of a genetically incumbent nation, but he is the father of all who believe like he believed before he was circumcised while he was essentially a Gentile. 
what on earth does that have to do with us in the 21st century? Because nothing has fundamentally changed in the plan of salvation. If you want to enter the heavenly courts, walk through those pearly gates, put your feet on those golden streets, the prerequisite is that you choose to believe the promise of God. It has nothing to do with your past. It has nothing to do with what you may or may not do in the future. It has everything to do with whether you believe the promise of God. When God comes to you and He says to you, I have loved you, do you believe that or do you throw up all sorts of buts, ifs and maybes? When God comes to you and says, I have forgiven you in Christ, do you throw up all sorts of buts, ifs and maybes? Do you choose to believe the lies about God that perhaps your parents have taught you, perhaps inadvertently by their example, because I've not yet met a perfect parent, myself included? Do you, have you chosen to believe the lies that society tells about God and tells about you and your value and your image? Or do you believe what God has said about you in His Word? Do you believe, in other words, that when God says, I have done everything that is needed for your salvation, do you believe that or do you still want to throw up your additional works to supplement what He has done? Because the teaching of God's Word is, it is all by the promise of His Word. It is all by His efforts and by you choosing to believe what he has done. Now with that basis in mind, the first four chapters of the book of Romans, now we can have our scripture reading. Chapter 5. It says from verse 1, Therefore, therefore, that's why I had to tell you what was in chapters 1 through 4. Because the chapter 5 begins with the word, Therefore, in other words, now he's going to tell you the consequence of this. Now he's going to tell you the reality that flows out of this amazing grace. Until you understand the first four chapters, the therefore doesn't make any sense, right? Therefore, because everything is based on our belief in God. Therefore, having been justified by faith, faith is the belief, right? Faith is essentially Taking God at His word, saying what you have said is true. If you say you've done it, you've done it. If you say you've forgiven me, you've forgiven me. It doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter what others say. It doesn't matter what my circumstances are telling me. If you have said it, if you have promised it, you are for real. You can be trusted. You are authentic. You love me, God? I believe that. You've forgiven me, God? I believe that. You've accepted me, God, warts and all. I believe that on the basis of faith. That's about as practical as I know how to make the concept of faith for you. Stripping away its mystical implications and all the rest of it. That's about as simple as it gets. Taking God at his word, believing him that he's authentic, trustworthy, reliable and for real. Therefore, having been justified, made right with God, forgiven having been justified by faith, we, here's the consequence, have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Having been justified by faith, we have. And in the Greek, that little verb there, to have, means on an ongoing basis. Today, as we have had from the beginning to today and will continue to have in the future, you do not need to doubt it, you do not need to question it. We have on an ongoing basis peace with God. We are no longer at war with God because sin has been taken out of the equation. That's the justification part. That means to be forgiven. If you are forgiven, then God is no longer holding your sin to your account. And sin is that which separates you from God. Does that make sense to you? If you want a verse for that, check out Isaiah 59 verse 1 and 2. Your sin has separated you from your God. 
What is it that gets in the way of us being in the presence of God? Sin. Does that make sense? Okay, so somebody's going to say, well, what is sin? Sin is biblically defined, 1 John 3 verse 4, the transgression of the law. What does that translate into in reality? It means that if the law represents everything that God is, the basis of His character, the principles of His government, and Jesus comes along and says in the New Testament, I think it's Matthew 22 going from memory, He says that, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, including the Ten Commandments. If those Ten Commandments, the law of God, which we transgress, which is called sin, is essentially the law of love exemplified in ten basic principles that cover the whole of life, then essentially... Sin is choosing a lifestyle or a pattern or a behavior which runs directly contrary to the self-sacrificing principle of love that underpins the character of God. When you choose that lifestyle and you sin, the reason sin alienates you from God is because it's essentially a moral divorce. It's saying, I do not live by your principles. And if you've ever tried to live with someone that you do not agree with on any single point of action, then you will know what that means. Right? That's all that sin is. It's not something mystical. It's not something weird. It's not something I can't relate to. Sin is choosing a lifestyle and a pattern that goes directly contrary to the purity and to the love of God. And it happens to look like the Ten Commandments too. Do you get what I'm saying? That is what separates you and I from God. And Paul comes along and says, whether you are Jew or Gentile, supposedly believing or unbelieving, we are all suffering with the malady, the sickness, the disease of sin. And sin separates all from God, regardless of your race, of your gender, of your language, of your educational attainments in life, which is why rectifying any or one of or all of those things cannot save you because sin transcends all those things. Sin is rebellion against the character, the purposes, the love, the grace, the purity of God. And we've all done it. And so the good news is this, he says. God has provided a way for every single one of us again to be made right with God and it has nothing to do with your behaviors it has nothing to do with your promises for the future it has nothing to do with anything except what God has done and your choice to believe that what he has done is all sufficient and so it is a righteousness in the language of Romans chapter 3 which is apart from the law. Not that it's at odds with the law, not that the one negates the other, not that if you have the righteousness of Christ you don't need the Ten Commandments, but in the sense that while the Ten Commandments demonstrate and describe the righteousness of God, they have no power to make you right with God. Because once you have transgressed them, all you've done is said, I disagree with those principles. The principles cannot bring you back into agreement with themselves. So Paul says, here's what God has done, the amazing thing. He has demonstrated, apart from the law, without the law, he has demonstrated that same righteousness that's in the law in a living person, the incarnation of God himself, Jesus Christ. This living demonstration of the righteousness of God has the power and the ability to do what the law cannot in that this living representative of God's righteousness, Jesus Christ, can actually make up for your failures with regard to the law and can do more than that. He can reconcile you to God because He is the living, walking, talking God. Now you're thinking, we haven't read that in the book of Romans yet, so let's carry on. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace. How do, you, how do you obtain this grace? How do you receive it? Do you have to do some great thing? Do you have to first clean yourself up before you come to Christ? He says, no, 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 no. How do you obtain this grace? He says, you come as you are. That's why it's grace. Romans 4, jumping back there, makes the point that if you work for a wage, 
then it's not considered grace. It's considered what is owed to you. So to obtain this kindness, this righteousness from God, this being brought back into this healthy, saving relationship, he says, how do we obtain this grace? Well, the very word grace means you can't earn it. And so you simply have to believe him. That's the faith part. You have to believe that he's giving it to you as a free gift at his expense, at his cost. Because though grace is cheap for you and me, we simply believe in it. It cost heaven everything. Grace is frightfully expensive. But he gives it to you as a gift without any charge or works or efforts on your part. If you will just believe him that he's done it and that you accept it. So we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I love this. You know what that's saying? Saying when you choose to believe God, when you choose to accept that he's for real and that what he has done for you is for real, when you move into that paradigm of thinking, when you shift your consciousness so that you live in the reality, not in the maybes, not in the nice story, but in the reality that what he has done is for you and for real. He says you have a reason to get up in the morning no matter what this life throws at you. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We are looking forward to seeing him face to face. We have a direction in life. We have a, something new to live for that this world cannot take away. This world can take away your family. This world can take away your wealth. This world can take away your health. This world can take away everything you own and possess. It can take away your life. But it cannot take away from you the vision and the expectation of face to face with God in the heavenly world. No one can take that away from you except if you choose to consider it a fairy tale and reject the reality. Not even Satan can forcefully take it away from you. Oh, he will try and convince you to give it up. He will put all sorts of allurements in front of you. He will surround you with persecution and discouragement, but not even Satan can take it away from you. Because we are made right with God by belief in Him alone, and it's not based on your works and what you do that's good or what you do that's bad, get the ramifications of this. No one can take it away. Because what needs to be done has been done by God, and no one can change that. Do you understand the power of this concept? When you wake up in the morning and you think to yourself, my life is falling apart, why do I keep doing this for? You do it for something greater than this world. Why do I stay, stay alive in this world? Why not end it sooner? Why not give myself up to this concept of suicide? It's all pointless anyway. No, it's not, is what Paul is saying. Because we live, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And that word hope in the Bible is not some uncertainty. You know, like, I hope I'm going to win the lotto. I don't play the lotto, that's just an example. Don't get any, don't use me as your example, right? You know, I, I hope... I hope that my kids won't go off the rails. I, I hope this. I hope that. Really, when you and I use that word in common English today, what we mean is it's probably not going to happen, but it would be nice. Right? Do not read that interpretation into the word hope in Scripture because you will end up with completely the wrong understanding of what God is saying. The word hope in Scripture is an absolute guaranteed certainty that you simply do not have present with you right now. Does that make sense? It's a guaranteed certainty. Heaven is waiting for you. Christ has died for you. He has guaranteed you the glory of God. It is a fact. You're just not there yet. One day, your physical body is going to catch up with the present reality. Did you get that? One day, your physical body is going to catch up with this present reality. 
You're just not there yet, but it's already a done deal. There's nothing you need to doubt about it, nothing you need to question about it. It is a guaranteed fact. It is a reality. We have been justified by faith.